You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of The Professional Left, and available wherever you get your podcasts, and on our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a Patreon button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at The Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. This episode begins with a disclaimer. We are not healthcare policy professionals. However, like most of you, we live through the many battles of the Affordable Care Act in real time. Without the ACA, we wouldn't have health insurance, and we would have faced the kind of medical and financial disasters that have bankrupted so many American families. Fran, Blue Gal, my beautiful wife and partner, spent days or weeks, it felt like, felt like months on the ACA website, navigating the exchange, and became a real expert in her own right, and Twitter pals with Andy Slavitt. Although she denies it, I know it's true. I'm just a big (laughs) fan of Andy Slavitt, that's all. Yeah. The way you look at him, uh, no. (laughs) There's more going on there than than, than I think you care to admit to yourself. He is a hero of mine, let me put it that way. And and he, by the way, he is a genuine healthcare policy professional. He knows everything about everything. And if you want to really dig into this topic, you should buy his book. Um, Anyway, we lived and died with every Republican attempt to gut that law or defund it or have it thrown out of court uh, for legal reasons. And around here, we say that the generation that came up during those years will remember them as the time when their fathers were laid off and lost the family home during George Bush's Great Recession and when Republicans reduced their mothers to tears by bragging about taking away her family's health care. Our Affordable Care Act story begins more than a century ago, because you really need to take a running start at the issue of health insurance reform to understand how uniquely hard it is and how hard it has been to get anything done on health care in the United States and how consistent the opposition to expanding health care access has been. In 1912... Teddy Roosevelt and his progressive party endorsed social insurance as part of their platform, including health insurance. As he said in a speech, quote, of all the questions which can come before this nation, short of the actual preservation of its existence in a great war, there is none which compares in importance with the great central task of leaving this land even a better land for our descendants than it is for us. Let me add that the health and vitality of our people are at least as well worth conserving as their forests, waters, lands, and minerals. And in this great work, the national government must bear a most important part, unquote. In 1915, the American Association for Labor Legislation put out a draft bill for compulsory health insurance and ran campaigns in several states. But then came World War I and an anti-German fervor. There were articles commissioned by the U.S. government that denounced German socialist insurance, and opponents of health insurance attacked it as a, quote, Prussian menace, unquote, inconsistent with American values. Oh, no, not socialism, honey. (laughs) So around this time, California held a referendum on health insurance, and New York, and Ohio, and Pennsylvania— And even here in Illinois, they tried to put together some sort of health insurance reform. But after the war came the Red Scare, and opponents of compulsory health insurance began calling it Bolshevism and buried reform under an avalanche of anti-communist rhetoric. This was the end of any national health care debate for nearly 20 years. And more importantly, more than 40 years later, four decades later, Ronald Reagan would resurrect the anti-communist rhetoric when fighting to kill Medicare. And 50 years after Reagan, the same rhetoric would be used by the same groups to try to kill Obama's Affordable Care Act. Meanwhile, back in the 1920s, 1921 women reformers persuaded Congress to pass the Shepard-Towner Act 
which provided matching funds to states for prenatal and child health centers. The act expired in 1929, and Congress refused to reauthorize it. And that's a really important thing to remember when you're talking about uh, progressive reforms, because there are lots of ways for opponents to kill progressive reforms or weaken them. They can slash funding. They can change them into block grants. And they can add a sunset provision, which means at the end of five years or 10 years, the law has to be reauthorized. And that, you might remember, is exactly what happened to the 1994 assault weapons ban passed under Bill Clinton. Reformers were forced to include a 10-year sunset provision. And 10 years later, guess who was in the White House? It was George Bush and the Republicans controlled Congress. And just like that, the assault weapons ban was over and it has never been successfully resurrected. This is why today, Republican Senator Rick Scott floated the idea of attaching sunset provisions to Medicare and Social Security. Because if Republicans can't kill a reform effort outright, the next best thing is to plant a bomb inside of it set to go off when they think maybe political winds will have shifted in their favor. The early 1930s were the time of national health insurance and the New Deal. President Roosevelt appointed a committee to work on secure employment, retirement, and medical care issues. But in the end, there was a trade-off. Roosevelt sacrificed national health reform in order to get the Social Security Act passed. In 1939, Senator Robert Wagner, Democrat of New York, introduced the National Health Bill, which incorporated recommendations from the National Health Conference. This proposal died in committee. Four years later, in 1943, Senators Wagner and James Murray, a Democrat from Montana, if you can believe it, along with Representative John Dingell Sr. of Michigan, introduced legislation that would operate health insurance as part of Social Security. The Wagner-Murray-Dingle bill was the most comprehensive social measure ever introduced in Congress. It envisioned a federally sponsored health insurance program, along with permanent and temporary disability, maternity and death benefits, full federalization of the existing federal state unemployment insurance, expansion of old age and survivors insurance, and enlargement of public assistance. A more modest version of the health insurance proposals had been introduced previously by Representative Thomas Elliott of Massachusetts in 1942 and by Senator Theodore Green in 1943. And here's a fun fact to underscore the fact that this is a multi-generation struggle. This is really hard. And the fight over health care gets passed down from one generation to the next because John Dingell's son, John Dingell Jr., also served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Michigan from December 13th, 1955 through January 3rd, 2015. And he was a champion of the Clinton administration's health care reform efforts, and he was critical to the passage of the Affordable Care Act in 2010. He was also serving when Republicans swept back into power in 2011, and in no small part thanks to their promise to eliminate the Affordable Care Act. And here's what Representative Dingell wrote in 2011. Quote, Today, nearly four months into the 112th Congress, this committee is holding yet another political show for the benefit of pundits here inside the Beltway. It is abundantly clear that without major reform to our health system, the status quo is unsustainable. After hard decisions, hours of debate and deliberation, Congress passed and the president signed the Affordable Care Act. Defunding the Affordable Care Act is not legislating. This is like taking an eraser to an answer on a test and then leaving it blank because you have no better solution. If my friends on the other side of the aisle want to defend the nation's bottom line, then why do they offer H.R. 2 repealing the Affordable Care Act and increasing the federal deficit by $210 billion? If my friends on the other side of the aisle want to create jobs, why repeal the Affordable Care Act, which will add 400,000 jobs a year for the next 10 years? American families need help now. They need protection from insurance companies dropping their coverage. They need help in providing health coverage for their college students. And they need help to afford their prescriptions under Medicare. These are all real solutions the ACA provides to families today and solutions my friends on the other side of the aisle would repeal and replace with nothing. Unquote. In 1944, the Social Security Board called for compulsory 
national health insurance as part of the Social Security system. Starting in 1945, after the death of Franklin Roosevelt, President Harry Truman picked up the mantle for a national health program just months after the end of World War II. Harry Truman in 1945, quote, Millions of our citizens do not now have a full measure of opportunity to achieve and to enjoy good health. Millions do not now have protection or security against the economic effects of sickness. And the time has now arrived for action to help them attain that opportunity and to help them get that protection, unquote. Much like Barack Obama in 2008, Truman was elected to a full term in 1948, running with a national health insurance plan as a centerpiece of his campaign, which sure looks like a mandate to me. But you'll never guess what happened next. Oh, oh, he- I'll guess. I can guess. Let me guess. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and guess, Drift Glass. Uh, no, I have no idea. I, everything passed and we're, we were all great. Well, Everything's you fine. know, this is 1948, right? Yeah, right. The opposition used fear of socialism. Socialism? I've socialism, heard of that. Socialism? Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. Coupled with the power of Southern Democrats who believed a federal role in health care might require desegregation. I just can't. Wait. Wait a minute. They used racism and socialism to block health care reform? And when you, th- when you look at the map of states that have not expanded Medicaid mm-hmm. today, in 2023, uh-huh. the solid South, I'm telling you. It's something the Confederacy. Else. It's the, the, those fuckers, those people. Yep. Well, and and I guess Louisiana has expanded Medicaid. I guess they've finally gotten around to it. But yeah. uh, well, Welcome to the 20th century. It's only the 21st. To, welcome to so. the 20th century is right. So those Southern Democrats and the opposition effectively blocked Truman's plan for national health insurance. Mm -hmm. In 1947, Truman tried again, sending another special message to Congress calling for a national health program. This is when the Wagner-Murray-Dingle bill and the Taft bill were both reintroduced. So in 1948, the American Medical Association launched a national campaign against all of the national health insurance proposals. Yeah, the, the AMA shows up a lot, like a rash all over opposition to healthcare reform, the same villains over and over again using the same tools. Uh, in 1952, the Federal Security Agency proposed the enactment of health insurance for just Social Security beneficiaries. And a year later, that agency was made into a cabinet-level agency and renamed the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Uh, then in 1956, legislation was introduced in the House to provide health insurance for Social Security beneficiaries, and it failed And then it was reintroduced again in 1959. This is when we hit the swing in 60s and the Great Society, which gave us Medicare and Medicaid. Thank you, Lyndon Baines Johnson. In 1961, a presidential task force recommended health insurance for the elderly. Imagine that, Driftglass. It's shocking. Shocking. Giving old people health care? What are you, insane? This isn't Are you a socialist? Yeah. This was under Social Security again. And President John F. Kennedy sent a special message to Congress. Representative King and Senator Anderson introduced a bill to create a government health program. The bill was aggressively opposed by, guess who, the AMA and insurance companies, and it was killed in committee. Also in 1961, a Hollywood B-grade actor named Ronald Reagan began to raise his national political profile by voicing a 10-minute LP about how Medicare was just the first step down that slippery slope to communism. Oh, I hate communism, Blue Gal. I just, uh, I can't, it scares me. It just scares me. So this is Ronald Reagan, quote, All forms of security, compulsory security, even against old age and unemployment, represent a beginning invasion by the state into the personal life of the individual, represent a taking away of individual responsibility, a weakening of national caliber, a definite step toward either communism or totalitarianism. You mean we get to pick? That'd be great. Either communism, I don't know. I think I'll take totalitarianism. (laughs) Uh, By the way, for you kids out there, an LP is what we olds call a long playing album. And for you kids out there who don't know what an album is, I weep for you. Uh, And I don't know how in the world you clean your pot. Maybe that's just me. My Drift class, old... I don't I hate to tell you this, but vinyl's coming back. Oh, I'm I'm I, I got rid of my record player when I moved down here. Got rid of all my records. Yeah, youngest child just bought an LP. 
Uh huh. What does she play it She's on? She's got a record player. Oh God. Yeah. Ah, oh, I should have seen ahead. Well, <laughs> I, all I need really from Pink Floyd is the album covers for Dark Side of the Moon, and I can clean my pot just like <laughs> I did in 1977. You <clears> have <throat> asthma. I don't care. <laughs> pot is good for asthma. Um, yeah, that's so, we're, when, anyway. Speaking of the 70s and 80s, Ronald Reagan was part of a stealth AMA campaign to stop the passage of Medicare called Operation Coffee Cup, which spent a lot of money labeling it as socialized medicine. And of course, every American understood that it's just a hop, skip and a jump from socialism to communism. Operation Coffee Cup was also one of the very first successful viral marketing campaigns in the modern age, and it launched Ronald Reagan's political career. In 1980, President Jimmy Carter, campaigning for re-election against Reagan, told crowds that, quote, as a traveling salesman for the American Medical Association campaigned against Medicare, Reagan sowed the fear that Medicare would mean socialism and that it would lead to the destruction of our freedom, unquote. When the subject arose on the televised debate in late October, Reagan responded, quote, uh, when I opposed Medicare, uh, there was another piece of legislation meeting the same problems before Congress. I happened to favor the other piece of legislation and thought it would be better for the senior citizens. I was not opposing the principle of providing care for them, unquote, which was a lie. One of the many, many lies Reagan told during and after his presidency. There was no such alternative legislation. Half a century later, that brain worm was still squirming around in the minds of Republicans. As we found out in 2009 during the Fox News sponsored protests against the ACA. One of the most memorable examples was during a town hall meeting when a woman named Katie Abram got up and screamed at Pennsylvania Senator Arlen Specter, quote, this is about the dismantling of this country. We don't want this country turned into Russia, unquote. This hysterical nonsense drew a prolonged round of applause from the mostly Republican crowd. In fact, we did a whole No Fair Remembering Stuff episode on Ms. Abram back in November of last year. Yes, we did. But getting back to 1962, President Kennedy addressed the nation on Medicare, and that was televised from Madison Square Garden. The American Medical Association shot right back with a televised rebuttal. In 1963, Kennedy sent another special message to Congress, and the King-Anderson bill was reintroduced. In 1964, following President Kennedy's assassination, President Johnson sent his own special message to Congress, again, advocating for Medicare. Like many others of his proposal, LBJ argued that he was doing what Kennedy would have wanted, harnessing the grief and sentiment of the nation over the fallen leader. In 1965, the Medicare and Medicaid programs were both signed into law by LBJ. Yay! That's, yeah. Interestingly Look. enough, in 1971, Nixon's wage and price controls began with medical care, singled out for specific limits on annual increases in physician and hospital charges. Medical care limits were not lifted until 1974, over a year after other controls had ended. In 1977, President Jimmy Carter proposed a Medicaid expansion for poor children under age six. The proposal failed to come to a vote in Congress. And this brings us up to the 1980s and the Reagan-Bush years. And it's not going to surprise you that during the Reagan-Bush years, very little was done to improve America's very complicated and expensive and failing healthcare system. Uh, in fact, it's wrong to even call it a system since there really isn't one. Now, there was one innovation uh, that they did, which was the passage of COBRA in 1986. And COBRA stands for the Consolidated Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act. And it contained regulations that would allow employees who lost their jobs to continue with their health plan for 18 months. Now, I personally was on COBRA a couple of times and found it to be an excellent way to go broke very quickly when you're unemployed. Yeah, you uh, lose your job and your paycheck and all of a sudden you have to pay 300% of what you had been paying for health insurance. Yeah. and Out of God, pocket. And God help you if you have a pre-existing condition. Yeah. Yeah. Because and I was terrified. I was terrified that the doctor would find out I had asthma or whatever, and I would just be canceled for life. This is this is the sort under yeah. which we all lived. If anyone finds yeah. out anything that's wrong with you, down you go. <clears throat> but then came the Clinton administration in 1993, 
And within the first his first week in office, President Bill Clinton convened a White House task force on health reform. And he appointed his wife, First Lady Hillary Clinton, as the chair of the task force and gave them the thankless job of working out the details of a managed competition approach, which was going to be called the Health Security Act. President Clinton sent a detailed plan to Congress in 1993, because that's what you do when you're being responsible. And it was a huge mistake because all Republicans did was use it as a prop to mock the very idea of health care reform. Uh, Clinton's plan called for universal coverage, employer and individual mandates, competition between insurers, with uh, government regulating cost control. The opposition was largely funded by two groups. You'll never guess who they are. The Health Insurance Association of America and the National Federation of Independent Businesses. Now, the Health Insurance Association of America began quickly airing what some of you will probably remember as the Harry and Louise television ads which portrayed a middle-aged white couple desperately worried about health care under the Clinton plan, plans which they were terrified would be designed by indifferent government bureaucrats, which sounds a lot like communism to me, Blue Gal. <laughs> and the tagline was, they choose, we lose. Now, while we were doing research for this podcast, I totally forgot and rediscovered to my delight that the Clintons shot their very own Harry and Louise commercial that was, first of all, actually pretty good. And second, didn't change anything because it was actually sarcastic and funny instead of ripping into Harry and Louise and the Health Insurance Association of America as the paid liars that they were. So the Health Security Act was shot down, as was every other health care reform proposal in 1993. This was largely thanks to Republicans funded by lobbyists. The McDermott Wellstone single-payer health insurance proposal was dead on arrival. Also dead on arrival was a managed competition health care reform proposal known by some as Clinton Light, which was co-authored by Representative Jim Cooper, Democrat of Tennessee, and the Love Boat's very own Fred Grandy, who was by then a Republican representative from Iowa. It was basically Clinton's plan, but without requirements for businesses to provide health insurance, and it did not cap health spending. It was the fifth major health reform proposal to be considered in the single year of 1993. Think about that. Five major health reform proposals in one year. Mm -hmm. And this was the first to garner any bipartisan support with 27 Democratic and 19 Republican co-sponsors. Here's a quote from Representative Cooper, quote, we feel that managed competition will work better back home and may be the only way to break the partisan gridlock in Washington. The administration started with managed competition and went to the left. The Republicans took managed competition and went to the right. Our bill is squarely in the middle, unquote. <laughs> Obviously, such a sensible centrist approach that rejected the extremes on both sides, Drift Glass. Uh huh. That's going to yeah. sail through Congress, right? Oh, sure. I'm sure it went past, and I'm sure it got hundred, a standing ovation. Hundred votes in the Senate, right? They stood up and applauded because everyone knows a sensible centrist approach is exactly what is necessary. That to always pass passes, reason. doesn't it? Right. No, thirty years ago, thirty years ago, this both sides crap was was still, you know, the answer to every problem, and it never ever worked. So, you know, yep, because ha, ha, ha. no, it didn't pass. <laughs> No, it did not pass at all. By 1994, even an incremental watered-down compromise bill that doesn't have a mandate in it or price controls, like Cooper Grandy, was doomed to fail. Um, plus, added bonus, every compromise moved the health care reform debate further and further to the right, which was another delightful GOP no-win scenario because no compromise was ever going to satisfy the major lobbyists on the right, the large employers, and the large insurance companies. But every time the bill lurched to the right, it did succeed in pissing off the Democratic Party base and alienating a lot of groups that got Clinton elected. Also, the sheer number of bills being tossed around all at the same time fractured that very fragile reform coalition. Now, not to get too deep in the weeds here, but if you've listened so far, you must have noticed that 
While majorities or even large pluralities of America in every poll since 1954 have favored some form of a universal health care program, any such proposals always faces the same opponents, Republicans and the Southern conservative Democrats who would eventually become Republicans and the insurance industry and wealthy funders. And they always use the same tactics. Liberals want to use scary big government to force whatever it is down your throat. Which brings us to a short story about a group called the Reform Writers. The Reform Writers were a group of middle-class Americans with heartbreaking stories of healthcare hardships who toured the country by bus to spread the good news of Clinton healthcare reform. But by the time the buses rolled, the right had fired up the big, scary government megaphone. The opposition was funded by Richard Mellon Scaife, who also bankrolled the Arkansas Project, which was designed to destroy the Clinton presidency, through a front group called Citizens for a Sound Economy. The Citizens for a Sound Economy coordinated very closely with prominent conservatives like then House Minority Leader Newt Gingrich. Ever heard of him? And hate radio king Rush Limbaugh. Ever heard of him? They got a hold of a map of the reform writer's route and organized at each stop using networks of the Christian Coalition and other conservative anti-tax groups. And they made sure the media was there. And once again, a grown-up debate over this very complex issue was buried under an avalanche of scary government-run healthcare hysteria, which sure sounds an awful lot like the Tea Party, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. In 1995, when the Gingrich Republicans swept to power... Prospects for health care reform went from grim to nearly dead. In fact, the first thing the new Republican Congress tried to do was strip senior citizens of the health care they already had by cutting $250 billion from Medicare, which the CBO projected would drive half a million senior citizens into poverty. Republicans didn't care. Their massive cuts passed the Republican House and Republican Senate and were ultimately vetoed by Bill Clinton. It was Clinton's refusal to gut Medicare that was the main reason Gingrich shut the government down for 21 days. So what do dedicated health care reformers do when Republicans, insurance lobbyists, and wealthy right-wing crackpots kill health care reform for the 100th time in 100 years. They try again for the 101st time to make whatever progress they can, which is how Hillary Clinton got the S-CHIP program, the state children's health insurance program passed in 1997 with the help of Ted Kennedy and Orrin Hatch, despite strong Republican opposition. The CHIP program provided health care coverage to more than 8 million children and was the largest expansion of taxpayer-funded health insurance coverage for children in the United States since the establishment of Medicaid in 1965. And as an aside, the majority of children born in America today are born under Medicaid. Yep, yep. Because of Hillary Clinton. Under President Obama, the Children's Health Insurance Reauthorization Act of 2009 extended CHIP and expanded the program to cover an additional 4 million children and pregnant women. But the 1997 Census Bureau survey estimated that 42.4 million Americans still remained uninsured. And that number was growing. By 2007, it would be 45.6 million uninsured. And this is before the 2008 crash when everyone lost their jobs and their health insurance. Oh, yeah. This is, this is pre-COVID, pre-Great Recession. Pre you know, this all is, of it. Yep. Yeah. We these had are the good old days, Blue Over Gal. 45 the, million people without insurance. These are, these are the good old days. These are the yeah. days that we want to go back to. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Republicans in Congress and their financial backers were committed to making sure absolutely nothing was done about it. However, at the state level, where things, you know, the rubber meets the road, some interesting things are actually happening. In Massachusetts, which is a very, very blue state that Blue Gal lived in for many years and that for some reason likes to elect centrist Republican governors every now and then, <laughs> Mitt Romney, who is now a senator from Utah, 
was elected governor in 2003. And in 2006, Mitt Romney signed into law what became known as Romney Care, which provided health care coverage to nearly all Massachusetts residents. The law required residents to obtain health insurance coverage and called for shared responsibility among individuals, employers, and the government in financing the expanded coverage. Within two years of implementation, the state's uninsured rate was cut in half. Now, it's important to pause here and note that this was Mitt Romney's signature policy achievement. He bragged about it in his biography, and it shows up symbolically in the background of his official state portrait with a folder featuring a caduceus, which is a uh, serpent and cross symbol that you see on pretty much everything associated with medicine or medical interests or medical alert bracelets, etc. Now, six years later, running for president against Barack Obama, we would find Mitt Romney lying his ass off about Romney care, which he had edited out of the paperback edition of his biography. And the distance between those six years, between 2006 Mitt Romney and 2012 Mitt Romney, is the story of the Affordable Care Act. And we will be covering that on our next No Fair Remembering Stuff. Is there anything else you want to say about the fact that this has been going on for a hundred years? Uh, as with other things we've done in the past, uh, doing some uh, subject dropped into intensely, um, looking at, taking a long view of a subject. When you go through it like a flip book, when you go through an entire century of, of halting progress stopped by the same villains over and over and over and over again, um, the same party voting to cut its own throat over and over and over again. The same rhetoric being used over and over again and successfully. And just the the amount of exhausting struggle that you find in the Dingle family, which you know goes from father to son to after John Dingle Jr. died to his wife, trying to advance this this need for health care just a little bit. And it's so goddamn hard. And then you have people rolling their eyes and go, well, why didn't Barack Obama just do it all? And, you know, the uh, control of everything, you know what? And it's this, you don't, you really don't know what the hell you're talking about, do you? You really don't. You know, the, the dilettantes and assholes who, who just look at, I didn't get everything I wanted, therefore there must be some vast conspiracy to stop it, or they're all in on it, is an insult to people who spent their entire professional careers trying to get health care for the American people, like Bernie Sanders. Right. Bernie Sanders signed on to the Affordable Care Act. And Bernie Sanders was a villain to some on the left because he sold out. Like, no, I'll take what progress I can get. And that's what really I find infuriating, is people who do not know what they're talking about, looking down their nose at people who fought their whole lives to make a little bit of progress, and, and saying, well, clearly, you know, you're not doing it right. That's what pisses me off. That's, that's what really bothers me, is, yeah. you know... The fight has been going on for a hundred years. That's the thing that uh, surprises me is that, and and also pleases me that we keep fighting. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all, and we make inc from... incremental progress, but we've got a long way to go. I've been um, talking with some friends and coworkers of mine, several of whom are still uninsured in 2023 yeah. because their states have not expanded Medicaid yeah. and they're working people. They have jobs. Mm -hmm. and they don't make enough money or work enough hours to have employer-sponsored health care, mm -hmm. and they postpone significant health care, surgeries, and so forth. Uh, there was a story at Common Dreams um, at, featuring Bernie Sanders, as a matter of fact, saying that 38% mm -hmm. of Americans now report this year that they or a family member put off needed medical care because it was too expensive. Yep. And that's because... The, the incremental progress that was made with the Affordable Care Act involves high deductibles. It does. Our deductible is insane. And people are still, you know, waiting and crawling and dealing with pain and, and uh, postponing significant health care until Medicare kicks in. Yeah. Because at, at 60 to 65, they're waiting to get cancer screenings because they don't want to pay they know they can't pay mm -hmm. for treatment. Well, and medical bankruptcies was the great sort of untold story until people started talking about the Affordable Care Act, yeah. which were just the thousands and thousands of people who went bankrupt every year mm -hmm. because of a broken leg or because of a surgery right. or because they right. got into a car accident. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the whole one paycheck away from being broke thing is shattered by medical expenses. Absolutely. Um, and 
But when you've got a $6,000 deductible like you and I do. Yeah, each. Yeah. uh, You know, if if one of us gets sick, we have to out of pocket, you know. How how many months of income is that for us, Rick? <laughs> that's that's a, that's it's a bit of a bite. It's a um, it's a bite. Yeah. Fortunately, yeah. we're both in our twenties and in perfect health. <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> oh no, we're not. Your well, class is sixty two, and I'm fifty nine. So yeah. yeah. Well, and and as our president Joe Biden has said more than once, um, don't compare me to the Almighty. Compare me to the alternative. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what? What is the Practice part of the, the the trigger for this podcast. We have a long list of of no fair remembering stuff we want to do, but part of the thing that moved this to the top of the line were the number of people who just just dismissed the idea that this that healthcare reform is difficult at all. Yeah, that you yeah. know, well, it, Obama had all the votes. He just didn't want to do it. There must have been a conspiracy. It must have been some. He didn't you know, want agreement. to do Medicare for all. Right. He didn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, he didn't want to do that at all. And they've and, really forgotten. And and we're going to get into what really happened yeah, oh on God. the next show. It was, you know, it was something that, and this is a cliche by now with, with Donald Trump and, and George Santos and all, but you couldn't script a more um, sort of tumble down the stairs and hitting everyone on the way down um, disaster that mm-hmm. the run up to trying to get this thing passed was with, you know, deaths and rezoning and redistricting and party flipping and blackmail. And every time they thought they had it in the bag, something else popped up that they had no control over. Right. And the idea that, that over the course of a century, progressives have kept their focus on certain issues. It's like, you know what? I, I won't make, I won't live. It's like building a cathedral. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. not going to live to see this building complete, but I am by God going to get it started. And I know that a century or two from now, my grandchildren or great grandchildren in this community will have the thing I started today, yep. and that's something that we take for granted. That we want all of that. We want the cathedral right now, and I wish politics worked that way. I wish you know getting rid of the opposition was as easy as you know twitching your nose and and calling down lightning from heaven. But it doesn't work that way. And if you think it works that way, you shouldn't be involved in policy discussions because you'll go insane. Mm-hmm. You should go to Twitter and bitch about it. That's where <laughs> that's where you belong. But you know, and I counsel patients. And I remember at twenty, I was not patient at all. I was I was the idiot who voted for John Anderson because Jimmy Carter wasn't liberal enough mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I, re- I remember that. I'm not old, so old I don't recall that. But it is simply the case. I, I remember being online. Um, it was a Huffington Post event at Columbia College, and I was writing about the the, the whole citizen journalism scam. Mm-hmm. Where you know mm-hmm. you do all the work and send us all the work and we'll monetize it and we'll give you credit for it and then we'll cash out after for the a few exposure. Years and, You're sure, writing for the exposure, it. yeah. But I was in line with people and I I was teaching at Columbia College at the time. I I, I was um, in line with people who were just livid that Barack Obama didn't use his you know wasn't using his Green Lantern skills to pass Medicare for all tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I listened to them complain. I'm like. I remember being this young. I remember being this angry. And, you know, kid, you have no idea what you're talking about. That is not how anything works. That is not how, that's never been that way. And maybe you got your hopes up too high and you got your heart broken, which is probably good for you. It was good for me. Got my heart broken when Reagan won. Um, But it really does take a look back over the course of decades and decades and decades to see how long this struggle has been and appreciate people, especially like in civil rights, who've been in a struggle for hundreds of years Mm -hmm. and who look at people who are pissed because they didn't make, you know, a miles worth of progress in a day. Like, dude, it took us how many, how many decades to get from out, get out from under slavery and a hundred years to get out from under Jim Crow and how many decades until the Civil Rights Act and on and just people who have that kind of patience and endurance, I, I think are heroic. And but their story isn't flashy or sexy. It just is how the way things work. And I think that we don't appreciate the fact that people who are in it for the long haul are really doing a great job given the world we live in. And we will be covering that on our next No Fair Remembering Stuff in two weeks. Next week, we will post our monthly Science Fiction University at our sister site, sciencefictionuniversity.com. Don't forget, we're looking for about 30 more Patreons to make this podcast fly. 
So if you can afford to support us in that way, please do so at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. And we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. The Professional Left Podcast No Fair Remembering Stuff Tuesday edition is produced under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2022-23, DGBG Productions.